So I'm trying to make a segue in this uh, lecture between uh, the real economy that we've studied uh, up until now and, and money, uh, monetary affairs. Uh, it's, a, it's a permanent question in macroeconomics that keeps coming up time and again. And now we've had a, a significant increase in inflation. And it's easy to blame it on, uh, on gas prices or oil prices. But it's actually possibly more fundamental than that. So the, the, this, this lecture. Uh, makes me very excited, but it also makes me a bit scared because uh, looking back on my the past uh, 20 years of teaching this course, we've had a, a sort of a benign view of inflation. Yeah, it's, it's just out there and 2-3%. Two, two, and uh, we have to deal with situations in many countries in the world where the inflation rate is maybe 10 times higher or, or even uh, um, 100 times higher. And how do we get to that place? Um, and whether it's an equilibrium that can be sustained is, is one of the big questions of monetary economics. So I'd like to, I'd like to use this, this opportunity to change the course a little bit. So if you've been watching my videos, I hope you have been, increasing my numbers, my click numbers. But uh, in case you have, um, you'll, you'll be surprised that lecture eight is uh, not uh, corresponding exactly to what I'm doing today. So I'm trying to adapt to what I see as a changing um, focus on the um, sustainability of inflation. And this is always, it's, it's always been out there. So one of these, one of these uh, frameworks we'll look at is by um, a fellow named Miguel uh, Sidrowski, who is from Argentina. Uh, he, he was a little bit like Ramsey. He died a little bit too early um, before he could really make some serious contributions. I'll show you a way of thinking about inflation and monetary growth in those terms. And you'll get a couple of interesting notions um, about where we're going. But ultimately, we'll get back on track next week. Um, so pay attention if you can. Um, this model is, um, is kind of uh, for, usually for graduate students in, in really good universities around the world because it's, it's considered a bit esoteric. But it's exactly an application of what we did with the ramsey cass Koopmans setup. And ramsey cass Koopmans is should be like understandable to all because it's a, it's a bread and butter setup. You, know, you really need to use this. And you learn the tools uh, dealing with that model. And, and Sidrowski was, um, was clever enough to use those same tools um, to think about money. And we'd like to see what that, what that implies. Ultimately, it will imply that expectations are key. So uh, we'll talk about frictions in the macroeconomy. And we'll talk about the labor market, giving rise to some labor market pressures. But in the, in the most recent episode, we see a, an absence of those pressures in many countries, and we still see an increase in inflation. So it can't be all just wages rising faster than productivity. Okay, So what you learned in, in college may be uh, only marginally relevant to understanding what's going on. Uh, one of the main, main lessons of Sadrowski and, and uh, another model we'll talk about, it, which is Kagan's model, um, look at the future price as a, a way of fixing people's uh, pricing or other behavior in the present period. So future uh, expect, expectations of future developments are, are actually impacting immediately on the present. This is a very important theme of macroeconomics um, and, and will accompany us till the very end, um, which makes it actually quite exciting. So you know, do, do, are people rational? Are people uh, crazy? Uh, is there something in between? Uh, well, whatever the answer is to that question, it's going to have to do it's going to have a lot to say about what the economy will do in the future. And I tend to be, belong to the group that thinks that people on average get it right, and we should deal with that. Economists should understand that and not try to think about ways to, to fool people. And throughout the course, that's going to be a theme. It'll be a, it'll be a theme in a lot of other lectures as well. And um, after I talk about Sidrowski, um, I'll talk about his sort of a predecessor, which was uh, an economic historical perspective on inflation. So you know, I already mentioned in the last class, we talked about money being neutral, this sort of feeling that maybe Hume was right. Um, well, you can, you can show this formally, but you can also show a lot of countries that have had very high inflation and yet still grow a lot, like Turkey is a great example, but also Argentina. Argentina is a country where they've had extreme inflation, hyperinflation. And uh, since the 1920s, Argentina has not grown that much. So in my view, that's kind of an indication that something underlying um, this history of continuous uh, 
hyperinflation must have a, a, an effect on people's behavior that goes beyond just money is a veil, money is neutral. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, we also saw what happened to, to Germany in 1922-23. If, if you forgot, we'll talk about it again. I'll show you some pictures. Um, again, another interesting uh, aspect of, of inflation. So not to say that what we're about to experience in Europe in the next few years will be a hyperinflation. I would clearly not go in, in that direction, but we need to, to deal with historical episodes where we have seen high inflation, and in some countries high inflation has, has um, sort of diverged to a hyperinflation, or it has, it's, it's, uh, it's been, the situation sort of corrupts itself. And how to understand that is really um, what this uh, little phase of the course is all about. So last time we really had a really easy lecture. I just sort of showed you some, some interesting principles. I showed you a balance sheet. The balance sheet's an important way of thinking about um, how to make money matter or even make money relevant. We know that money matters. It's not just uh, an invisible sort of dark matter in the economy. It does, it does have an effect, okay? And some of my colleagues have, um, are a bit less interested in this in question than I am. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of tension between uh, schools of thought. Um, in the long run, I think it's fair to say that a monetarist approach is probably right, but the long run is a long time. So taking Turkey, for example, I really like that example because, and I just discovered it last year, it really works. And I put it in the slide, so if you didn't get that, look at the slide, right? So if you take long enough perspective, price, the price level and the supply of money are fairly highly correlated. It's not saying that one causes the other, but there's sort of a, an equilibrium condition. What matters is what people do with the money. It's like Hume said, okay, so keep that in mind. That's gonna be part of, of the Sidrowski um, setup. So uh, I introduced this notion of neutrality, that the price level uh, and the money supply kind of, um, you know, you can imagine uh, a world where prices have 50,000 uh, in front of them and other prices have uh, 10,000 and you can imagine a country where you have five and, and, and one, okay? What matters is the relative price. And when we introduced the euro, there was no really clear, immediate, real effect. I think there's a, there's a consensus on that. And there's not a consensus on whether what the euro did to monetary policy is neutral. Okay, so that's a, that's a question we'll try to answer today. Maybe the introduction of the euro changed the path of money into the future and that may affect what we're gonna experience. Another good example is Turkey. Why did Turkey suddenly move into a high inflation mode given the 90s and the 2000 decade, which, which was quite, quite favorable in, in terms of inflation? Well, something happened to monetary policy in that period, and I'll let you go figure it out. I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's something you should, as critical economists, you should be able to understand. And you have a question. talking about Turkey, 1960 to 2019. And if you had come last time, you would have seen that wonderful slide that I worked very hard to put together. Yeah, so take a look at it. So we, we try to motivate this with a model with, with, with overlapping generations, just a, just a verbal motivation. A, a PhD course might actually get into detail here, but the idea is that money in itself has, has no value um, in, this, in this model. It's pure fiat money, and yet people who are young accept it because they expect the future to give them the, the possibility of smoothing their consumption in the second period. That's an incredibly important insight of Paul Samuelson in his 1958 uh, paper on overlapping generations, and it's also in the diamond model, except diamond has people using the physical ownership of, of a factory, a sto you know, stocks or your house, as a way of transferring um, or moving consumption into, into the period when you're old and can't um, earn resources on your own. In the absence of that, people are very, very miserable. In the absence of this paper social contrivance, people are miserable when they're old because there's no way that young people will give, them, unless they're very generous, just say, here, take something. But in fact, a, a young person would like to save resources into the future and has no means of doing so unless there's a a medium of exchange that allows that person to, to save into the second period. So that's, that's, again, if you understand that, you understand how expectations matter because 
an equilibrium of that model is money has no value. The price of goods in terms of money is infinite. That's the logic that carries through to the Sadrowski model. Okay, and the other equilibrium is we believe, and it does have value. And maybe the reason we believe is because the government authority that's, that's giving the old people money that they can spend when they're older is not out of control, just giving them enough money so they can actually uh, solve the dual co the coincidence of wants problem. We derived an idea of a demand for money. I'll do that again today. So we'll actually, I mean, it's, it's, you know, everybody wants money, right? But <laughs> that's not the question. The question is, you have wealth, and you want to hold some of your wealth in the form of money, and money has a lot of disadvantages. One of those disadvantages is it doesn't bear interest. So if you put it in a bank account, you don't get any interest, or you get a little tiny bit of interest. And, and the bank is probably taking fees at the same time. So it, you're losing. And if you put it in a, in a house, in capital, uh, in the stock market, you'll have a higher rate of return. So you'd want to hold most of your wealth in that form, but you want to, sp you want to be able to be liquid and spend anytime you, you, you please, then make, holding money makes sense. So that's the, that's the trade-off that Tobin and Baumol, uh, these giants of, of economics in the 1950s, but actually Keynes in the 1930s talked about. So people have been talking about this a long time, the demand for money, and it's still in the background. Even in a world where the, the, the central banks are setting interest rates, you still have a demand for money. Okay, that demand for money is, is basically um, responding to other determinants of the demand for money, even when the interest rate is, is, is stabilized by the central bank. Okay, so last time we, 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 just to repeat what I just said, you know, fiat money is rational. So all this garbage you hear about, about cryptocurrencies, and they're much better than fiat money. The reason why cryptocurrencies are possible money is because people will accept them. And if people stop accepting them because they can't sell them, of course the price is gonna fall. So as a candidate for money, uh, cryptocurrencies have not held up very well in the, in the recent period, probably because they also don't bear interest. They may allow you to conduct illegal activities, and that gives rise to a demand for this type of money. But in terms of the opportunity cost of holding your wealth in Cryptocurrencies, eh, not so great, especially if you think the price is gonna fall. Okay, store of value function is not so great. So the government guarantees, guarantees that people will accept your money because it passed a law and it's hard to evade that law, then it works a bit better than cryptocurrencies. Right, that's the logic. But cryptocurrencies could be a money, you could, it's a candidate, people could actually have many different types of cryptocurrencies. You just gotta find someone who will take them off your hands when you wanna spend them. And when you have a platform, you think you have someone who will take it off your hands. It's just a promise. Okay? So we, we say the money demand is a derived demand. It comes from its usefulness that it fulfills some sort of constraint or meet, allows you to, to meet some sort of constraint that you have to pay for goods in terms of cash or some fraction thereof, or you get some utility from saving your shoe leather because you have to keep going to the to the to the bank all the time, uh, you don't wanna do that, so have some cash in your pocket, have some money on a bank account that's, that you can spend quickly, you know, that's the trade-off. We talk about opportunity costs. Great concept in economics, opportunity costs. What are opportunity costs? Anybody, this is like Joan Robinson, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's what you're for, foregoing to do something. So, you know, if you, if you stay in bed today, t tomorrow or today, you're, you're, for, you're foregoing something. You're foregoing the possibility of working or coming here and studying and listening to me talk. Okay, so that's the, the best alternative. And the best alternative to having cash is to put the cash in a interest-bearing asset. So good luck, find one. Interest rates are rising, but they're still very low. So right now we don't care about it very much, but if interest rates are 10%, then you care about it more. And if they're 20 or 30%, or if the opportunity cost of holding money is the rate of inflation, 50% uh, per month in a hyperinflation, then you really, you wanna keep your cash balances as low as possible. All right, so that's the, that's the idea that we're gonna to pursue today. So we're gonna spend a lot of time thinking about minus inflation. That's the opportunity cost of holding money. And if inflation is zero or 2% it's not so much, but if it's 20%, you'll, you'll pay more attention to it. And if you don't believe that, just visit a country with a high inflation rate. People spend a lot of time 
running to the bank and exchanging for dollars or for, for euros to keep it out of the, the local currency except when they need it because they may have to have it and they may get paid in the local currency and that makes it kind of unpleasant. I, I remember visiting Romania once in 1992 and they had a very high inflation rate, not a hyperinflation, but I went, I took a, a 50 pound banknote to the currency booth and I, did, I just didn't know, I just put it in there. And the guy gave me a sack of 10 lay notes. So the sack was like huge. And I really kind of felt nervous because all these people were like standing around me. I said, if one of these people <laughs> just grab this and run away, it's, uh, it was like a, a brick of, 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 of bank notes. So the opportunity cost of, of um, in a situation where the price of those, uh, of goods in terms of that stuff is going up real fast, you don't want to hold too much of it. So you, want to, you probably don't want to, want to spend it real quick, right? Because spending it is one way of getting rid of it. It's a hot potato. Okay, so here's my hero of the day. Actually, there are two today. This is Miguel, Miguel uh, Sudrowski. He was from Argentina, um, really smart guy. Went to the University of Chicago. They kind of corrupted his mind a little bit there. <laughs> but he uh, learned a lot from Milton Friedman. He learned about monetary economics. And he also took uh, courses with um, Uzawa, another famous growth economist. But then he went to MIT, his first job, which is a really top place. It's the best place in the world to do economics, okay? Uh, he had top publications, got very sick, and um, died at the age of 28. And Milton Friedman, who's not, was not very generous with his praise, <laughs> he, he writes, the death of any young man is a personal tragedy for his family and friends. The death of this young man is a grievous loss to our profession in the world. Here's a man who would pub pushed out the frontiers of our subject who would have changed and added to economic analysis and would have enlightened and informed generations of students. Wow, I can say that I've done that. I've had a lot of generations of students, but I don't think I've had any path-breaking economic analysis. Struck down at the very beginning of his career, full of promise, but as yet almost bereft of fulfillment. So what a sad story, right? Um, anyway, when I was in graduate school, we learned his, his model. It's also it's featured in most of the really good graduate texts so I'm going to make you look at it just for a while, okay? It's also in the, it's in Campante et al. And there's a, there's a small mistake in there that you might have found. If you find it, uh, come talk to me about it and we can talk about it, okay? But the way, what you're seeing now is the, is the correct depiction. Okay, so we're going to ignore capital first. But Sudrowski, being the, the real uh, god of economics he was, he actually took capital on in, the very, in his paper. So I'm going to give you the baby version and then we're going to stop because I think you learn enough to get curious and maybe come back and do more. But the whole thing is about why we hold money, right? So I told you there are many ways to get money into a model. This is one way. And we're gonna use the tools we just learned, the Hamiltonian, all that stuff, we'll do it again. It's pretty straightforward and it kind of reinforces your intuition. And if you wanna read uh, the ebook, fine, but be aware that there's a Pretty interesting mistake in there, and if you find it, maybe I'll give you some, I'll give you a candy bar when you come into my office, <laughs> okay? And if you're really curious, read the original piece in the JP 1967. Okay, so this is what we're gonna start with. We're gonna start with an economy, just like with Ramsey, decentralized Ramsey, but this economy consists of um, households that don't just eat, they also carry forward their wealth, and they carry forward their wealth in two forms. One is a, um, a financial asset, and the other is money. And they get utility from having real balances. Okay, so that's a key assumption, and I told you last week, on Friday we had this lecture, which uh, I think will be posted soon. Um, the key difference here is that you actually get some utility from having money, so it's like, Think about Midas. Midas, the guy who had all the gold in his, in his chambers. He got utility from that. Well, this is a little bit different from that. You have the money in real terms because it helps you make it through life. There's lots of transactions you need to have. You know, you, you want to take a taxi. Do you have anything you can pay with? Do you have, ex do you have, your, you have your credit card? Credit card is nothing but access to your money, right, ultimately. Think about that. Um, so... 
it's good to have a little money around. And it's only good to the extent that it has real purchasing power. So you can have 10 euros, but if the price level of everything goes up by another 10%, 10 euros is worth a lot less, you're gonna notice it. So you probably wanna hold 12 euros in your pocket, okay? Or maybe 13 euros, or maybe 20 euros. So the, the, the idea is we're gonna always take the real value of money balances, real balances, real money, uh, as an indicator of what makes your life easier. So V, this V function, is basically an indicator function for the utility that you get from having this real stuff. You don't eat it, but it helps you get through life more easily. Get the cab, get the bus, um, pay for a sandwich, um, pay your rent. Otherwise, you have to keep running and selling your other asset putting in money, because you have to have money to make this transaction, that's the, the background. This can be derived in, in first principles from a lot of different models. The key thing is that, just like the utility function over consumption, you get utility from real balances, so the first derivative of V is positive, and the second derivative is negative. So it's, a, it's gonna be a concave utility. Having too much money around, it's, it's nice, but uh, not so great. So there's a decreasing marginal utility. Same idea. Now, there's a key thing that Sadrowski assumes that he doesn't really come clean with is the non-separability problem. Okay, so look at the additivity of V and U. The utility is just added together. And there's no interaction. So the marginal utility of having uh, of additional, additional unit of consumption is independent of the real balances you're holding. That's a pretty sneaky, susp suspicious assumption. Yeah, you might think that the marginal utility of consumption is actually increasing with money balances. Okay, but it turns out that's not a really crucial assumption, but it makes our life easier for today. Okay, so it's called intratemporal separability. The marginal utility of, of, of balances is independent of your consumption levels, and the marginal utility of consumption is independent of the, marginal, of the, of the level of real balances. Okay, we also have in tertemporal separability, and it's in continuous time, so it's the sum of, of instantaneous utility over your whole lifetime discounted at rate rho. Okay, so it's like Ramsey, except now we've got this money. Right, so Sadrowski is, you know, like the, the Ramsey of the 1960s. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind. That's a very important equation. So now, it's an expression. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an object. Okay, so we have all these people um, with these characteristics, now, the agent wants to make that as big as possible if the agent has a budget constraint. The agent can't just pull wealth off the shelf. The, the agent has to have the wealth, and to have the wealth, you have to accumulate it. So the, the, the evolution of wealth is this differential equation. A is the, is the sum of your real money balances and the other asset, okay? The stock of financial wealth. So financial wealth could be anything the government, the government issues bonds, we won't talk about it, or it could be the capital stock. Just the point is it's real, and if you read that, the chapter a bit farther, you can, you can, you can show, um, you can put all sorts of things in for A. It's just something you use to hold that bears interest. That's the key thing. It actually yields an interest rate. So in the Sudrowski model, it was actually the capital stock. Now that we have this, this thing called the Fisher equation that says that the nominal interest rate that you get on the, on, a, on the financial asset must be compensating you for inflation. So you're gonna get the real interest rate, we'll call it RT, plus the inflation rate pi. Okay, so we're already getting, we're introducing some new objects. Pi is the rate of change of the price level. We'll do that more rigorously in a second. In this baby version of the model for you guys, you know, I just, I, if you get interested in it, you can do the rest. The most important message comes out today, but important in this is the idea that um, income is, the, is what you need to consume. You can't consume the money, you can't eat it, right? You can spend it, um, but, and you can use it to, to trade for consumption. That'll depend on the price of consumption, but in the end, um, you gotta earn some real income. So real GDP is important in the background. I'll just make it constant. So it's just a constant. Make it really easy to focus on the most important uh, aspect. So households pay a tax, but the tax is gonna be the inflation tax. We'll come back to that in a second. It could also be a transfer. 
Okay, so you might, the, the government might be giving you some, like the government's doing now, just give people some, some free money. Okay, but the money is free only to the extent that you can buy some consumption with it, and that's going to depend on the price of goods in terms of money. So all these things are kind of popping up right now. We did this last time. It's a little bit like the OLG model, right? But now it's continuous. We have lots of people out there trading with each other. And we're going to write down the, um, this constraint in detail now. So that first equation, I have to rationalize. Where did it come from? Right? So I'm going to do that now. I'll take you through the very basic, because it's a differential equation in A. And I, A is the sum of the bonds that you have in real terms and the money you have in real terms. That's all that counts for you because you want to be able to exchange that with someone who's reasonable, who will trade with you um, for consumption. That's the only reason you're out there holding this stuff. Otherwise, you just consume, right? But there's a, there's a reason for that. Okay. So the household has a control. One of the controls is the consumption in each period. It can control the nominal money supply. Why? Because the price level is determined by the economy and your ability to trade the nominal money M and convert that into consumption C depends on the price of consumption, which is P. And remember, P is changing possibly, may even, may even jump. So in some sense, all these things have to be satisfied at the same time. The whole, the whole economy has to be willing to trade uh, with, it, with itself. And you've got this real bond which bears interest rate. So it bears interest rate R. And you can think of it as a treasury bill. Or think, think of the German uh, Bundesschatzbrief. And suppose that it actually pays you a guarantee. Suppose it actually gi give you a, gi like the French do, they, they give you a, a, a compensation for inflation. So in other words, it's really, it's, there's a real difference between holding money and holding this, this, this bond that gives you a guaranteed real interest rate. Now, I'm just doing that to make it easier for you to understand. You can imagine in the real world, there, there are Bundesschatzbriefe that don't pay compensation for inflation. So that makes it more complicated. But just think of it as a real alternative. It could, be, it could also be capital. And the Sidrowski model is capital. Yeah. Yeah, because of this compensation. So you, you, know, you, you, you get this, this real income Y, and the nominal value of that real income would be PY, and then you have a bond that you can buy, which is, we'll denote B, okay, and then you'd pay BP for that, and the P's cancel. You're trading your real income for this real claim on a real interest rate. It's a way of cutting through the, you know, we want to focus on money, so we'll just, we'll just there are ways you could be fooled on that as well, because what's it, what's, what is it about? It's about when the price level jumps and you're sit hold, sitting holding 10 euros and it's only worth 5 euros in real terms, right? That's what you want to, you want to focus on money. The money has that negative attribute that it's subject to the inflation tax. But the bond is not. The bond, you're indemnified for inflation, Okay. It's a, it's a figure of speech, it's a nice way of putting it. It's an expression that refers to the confiscation of real wealth that occurs because the price level rises. Okay, so it's, it's not really, a, the government controls the inflation tax in the long run because it controls the rate of growth of money. Okay, but we have to get there first. Right now, people perceive inflation, wow, I just lost, like right now, people feel in Germany they've lost 10% of their purchasing power unless their wages went up by a lot. Okay, that's called the inflation tax. And it is a figure of speech because the government doesn't really set that tax, but in the long run it does, right? Everybody with me? Okay. This is pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I like it. So the household is getting some income, and we're not going to tell you where it comes from. So this is not a completely general equilibrium model, but we could make it that way, and Sadrowski uh, arguably did. You've got these bond holdings, and I'm going to, I'm going to make R, um, I'm going to fix R just to make it even easier for you. So instead of RT, it's R, and BT is the holding of the bonds. I'm going to show you that if you think of bonds plus real money as being your A, then we're done. We can, we'll write the budget constraint in terms of this A and things are much easier. You're just deciding how much of, this, of my savings will I want to put in terms of money and what's left over, I put in the bond. So we don't need to track the bond. 
we'll get rid of the bond. But if you're a stickler, that's the budget constraint before I start massaging it. Okay, so the left-hand side are the uses, and the right-hand side are the sources. Remember, your life consists of income and expenditure. And that's exactly what this last equation shows. The right-hand side is your income, the interest income on your holdings today. You should put a, put a subscript T on the B. I'll do that. And then you get this, you get this transfer, so, or a tax. It's, it's written as a tax, but it, it could be a transfer. It could be negative. So the government could be printing money and giving it, giving it to you every, every period. That's how money gets into this economy. In the Sadrowski economy, there's, there's no uh, central bank. There's just the government goes out and does helicopter money or just gives it, gives it to people. That's a simplicity. That's just a, an act of simplification to make, to make it easier for you. But think about it. You can imagine all sorts of other things going on. So you could have a uh, pay, payroll protection program. Uh, you borrow from the central bank and then you transfer to the people. Um, all these things are possible. We're just making it as simple as possible. The government just hands out on the basis of what you already own, some extra euros, just to get the money into the system so people can spend it and consider it to be uh, part of their sources. Somebody had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the instant you get the money, the price level is PT. So for the small DMDT, you value it at the current price. That's a very important point that I'm about to discuss. So this is not the same thing as M little dot. Okay, and this is gonna stretch your mind a little bit, but think about it. Real balances is, is, is a ratio of nominal money to the price level. It's a race, just like the capital per, per capita was in the solo model. So the numerator is growing at a rate and the denominator is growing at a rate. And for little m, the ratio to be constant, they have to grow at the same rate. But they won't because the government's pushing more money into the economy. So the, 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 real, the real balances could grow, but it's a race between the numerator and the denominator. And this is the, the numerator part. The inflation tax hasn't appeared yet. Right? The household is, is spending its money in, it's getting its, its, its uh, its, its, whole, you know, its uses means it, it decides to hold it for the next D, instant DT. Okay, so the, and again, this is a, again, this is a differential equation. If you don't, you're not used to thinking of differential equations, think of a difference equation. Okay, so if the, if the delta is, gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you get a differential equation. Um, and this is like, I'm deciding the next instant, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna consume CT. I'm gonna accrete or increase my bond holdings in real terms, or I'm gonna increase my money holdings in real terms. I can't control the inflation rate. The inflation rate will hit me um, in the end. On the right-hand side, I've got a transfer possibly from the government or a tax. Here it's written as a tax, that's so following the book. And then you've got this income, your Y, and then you get this interest on the stuff that you were holding when you came into that instant, okay? And, and again, this is, true for every T, so this is like a string of these budget constraints that all have to be consistent with each other, right? Because if you, if you, if you save a lot, then your, your bonds will be growing and you'll have more interest rate, more interest uh, at a given interest rate in the next uh, following instance. So that's, the Sadrowski model is basically saying people um, kind of understand that, so this is the, the right way to write it down. If you want to, even though people are increasing their nominal money holdings, they understand that that is an effect on their real money holdings because there is this inflation tax. And to understand that, you just have to differentiate little m with respect to t. It's a race between the numerator and the denominator. Okay? And, the, and the, what's in a box is basically the, the race. It's a race between the rate of growth of the money supply at holding real balance is constant, minus the effect of inflation, which deteriorates the real value of those money balances. So it's a race. The only way to get little m to increase, to be positive in the, the dot, or m dot, is to have the rate of growth of money, which is the left-hand term in this box, m dot over m, to grow faster than the inflation rate. 
just like k over l. If you want k over l to go up, k has to grow faster than l. So it's the same thing with respect to money. Okay, so this is, a, this is, this is just a definition of, of, of what's happening to little m. And remember, you, you have utility over little m. You care about it. So you care about inflation, and that's why people in Germany are griping, right? It's, it's, it's kind of clear. Uh, if you go to Turkey, people gripe a lot more because inflation is much higher. And if you go to America, people are griping a little bit in between. And people lose, they get voted out of office. You know, inflation's not popular. And if we keep having inflation in Germany, I'm sure there'll be electoral consequences for that. Okay? This is just a definition. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to go back to the household's effective budget constraint. I'm going to just substitute. And then I'm going to show you how I can get rid of B because you can't control everything. You control your total financial wealth, your money, and your bonds, but you can't control all three at once. If you choose two, you've chosen the other one. Right? So that can help us simplify the problem a little bit as well. Okay? We're going to use these symbols again. We used them last week. Remember on Friday? Pi is the inflation rate, whether discrete or, and you'll use it with other courses as well. This is a, one of the few symbols that economists agree on. Pi is inflation. And I'm going to use mu for monetary growth. Okay, remember the, the government kind of controls that. The central bank controls that. The central bank is controlled by the government. Somehow they're all together in bed. Um, in this particular model, uh, the central bank controls uh, mu. So we can rewrite this equation that we had before as this race between monetary growth and inflation. So inflation rate, when the inflation rate exceeds monetary growth, m dot is negative. Okay, and this is a continuous time framework, so we're really looking at every, every point in time. Uh, so if you make it a discrete period model, it's just a, the, the, the change in, in real balances is a race between the discrete time analog of monetary growth minus the discrete time analog of inflation. So you can calculate that. You can go back to, go to Fred, download the data for China or for the United States, Germany, and you can calculate the real money supply dividing total M1 divided by the price level, and you can see how it changes over time. Yeah. Okay, little m is big M divided by big P, okay. right? Because m is, m is nominal. We discussed last week. We have nominal variables. We have real variables. And nominal variables are denominated in the currency unit, euros. And what matters is what you can do with those nominal euros or D marks. Remember D mark before monetary union? We used D marks. We had a different number in front of the... To, to, to pay for a bus ticket, and now we have euros. We're using a different currency, so it's just a change in the, in the denomination. The price level changed, but the supply of money and all the other prices changed at the same time. Okay, so it's just, a, it's just talking about neutrality. The dot is the derivative with respect to time, as always. We haven't changed that at all. I'm trying to be consistent. So dm dt is m dot. It's just shorthand. Okay, and if you if you. In this particular case, yes. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a bit of tension, of course. We'll, we'll have to talk about that. But, um, and there's a, as I said, there's a, there's a problem with Campante. <laughs> but it, you know, just, to, just to show you that I'm not like drooling over Sadrowski, this is a serious model. Okay, People have thought about it a lot. But there's an important uh, point that I'll make later. I have to get to that point first. So let's just, again, this is, this is mechanics. This is just a definition. And as I said, you can look up the numbers and do it yourself if you want. And this is true for everything. It's true for nominal GDP. Nominal GDP divided by money is a race be between two things, nominal GDP and, and money. So here, it's, if you think of real money, money divided by the price level, it's a race between the rate of growth of the numerator and the denominator. And I, I'm, I'm kind of being humorous here. People talk about helicopter money all the time, but Milton Friedman, the famous Milton Friedman, and, and Ben Bernanke, they talked about helicopter money. Because the, the question is, how do you get the money out there? You know, 
Because if you start giving it to people, people start lining up and crowding, you know, rioting, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. So you have to have some civilized way of delivering the means of payment to the people. And in, in a modern capitalist economy, we use the banks to do that. Right? The banks make loans and the loans become money. We use the loans, which are reflected on the balance sheet by, by uh, deposits that are matched by credits that they give to, to the real economy or to the government. That's how it works. But we could use, we could use we could use gold, but then you'd have to inject the gold into the system. How do you do that? You've got to get the gold first, and then you've got to figure, who do I give it to? If I give it to somebody, they have a huge advantage, right? They, they, get, they get all the purchasing power, and uh, nobody else may even know about it. Okay, and this is a world where everybody knows everything. Okay. So you can take that, that last um, expression we had on the, on the previous slide or up on the top, and you can rewrite it in the following way. You can rewrite it as the, the injections of nominal money at a given price level is nothing but the change in the real balances, M dot, plus, plus the, the effect of inflation on the money supply in real terms. Okay, that's just a, I'm just taking the left-hand side and writing it just rewriting it. So it's, it, in a sense, you can think of the, 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 the M dot over P as some sense, it's compensating for the loss that inc is incurred because of the inflation tax. To keep M constant, the government has to transfer more than, uh, um, it has to transfer enough to keep up with inflation, otherwise the, the real balances would shrink because of inflation. It's a race, right? So that's the way of thinking of this last um, rewriting. And if I do that, then I get a budget constraint that looks like that. Okay, so I've, I boiled it down a little bit to get rid of that big M dot. And I'm going very slowly now, obviously, because the next step is kind of, is getting rid of the B and the B dot. Again, this is just basic, basic uh, calculus, just doing some, some basic manipulations. But this budget constraint is very important. It's going to, it determines how much you can do with your resources. And now I'm going to do what, what Campanti does. He's going to say, I'm going to let A be the sum of those real bonds and the real money. Okay, so at any point in time, I can look at the price level, look at my nominal money holdings, and that implies a little m, and I've got my real bond there, which I've just made to be real, it's completely inoculated with respect to, to the price level changes. So you can, you can grant, that must be true. If A, T is equal to B, T plus M, T, then the first derivative with respect to time is the sum of those first derivatives, and that gives you A, T dot. Now I'm there. I just have to substitute it back into my budget constraint. And the Fisher equation, which says that the inflation rate plus the real interest rate is equal to the nominal interest rate. And that's the equation in Campante. Okay? So why, why did I do that? I want to show you that holding money has a cost. And that's what I said at the very beginning of the lecture. There's an opportunity cost. If you have cash at home and the inflation rate is 10%, then at the end of the year, you have lost 10% of your purchasing power. But you've also lost the opportunity cost that you would have had had you put it in the real bond. So it's not just the inflation rate. The inflation tax is there, but you also missed out on putting it in a bond. And if R is equal to zero, then don't pee. But if it's um, higher, then, well, you could have gotten even more. So it's the nominal interest rate that is the opportunity cost of holding money. And that shows up, and that's why Campante, I'll do that, because now we see directly that if I hold a little bit more real money, I'm going to be losing something. I'm losing not just the inflation rate, I'm losing this real interest rate, the opportunity cost of putting it in the bond instead. Now, if you get that, you've really cracked the nut. That's the secret of finance and monetary economics is understanding these trade-offs. Everything has a, has a cost, right? If you didn't put money in the stock market, wow, I could have put money in the stock market, you know? Um, stock market might have crashed, <laughs> then the opportunity cost ex post is not so high, but on average, the stock market does okay. It's a fact. Um, in expectation, maybe uh, you did lose something. Okay, so it's a sacrifice, foregone interest, not just real interest, but also the loss of value for holding it in this 
um, stuff, okay? That's a key insight of monetary economics, and Sadrowski was not the first person to figure that out, but it shows up very cleanly in his paper, and we still we talk about that all the time, especially now, okay? The cool thing about this is that A has a nice interpretation. It is the accumulated real command over goods that you have, right? It's the real savings in whatever form. At that point in time, it's the, it's the, the cumulative foregone consumption that you have. So it's getting very close to what we have with Ramsey. Remember the decentralized Ramsey? He was saving in the form of capital capital that he actually was, was being constructed in real time, uh, this is a bit more general. Okay, but again, you can put capital back in. Okay, so here's the, here's the objective of our guy. The, 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 the Sidrowski consumer wants to maximize utility. We already said this before, uh, but now he's got this extra bit. He cares about M, little m. And he knows he can't control it directly because the price level is moving around. So he's basically going to have to try to keep up with whatever inflation does to him. Okay, the budget constraint we just derived. And we have to be very, very honest. We have a, we have a condition we, took, we called uh, the no uh, free lunch or no Ponzi condition, which means you can't, you can't screw the bank. You can't keep going to the bank and rolling over and, Borrowing lots of money, making a negative, okay? We want to, we want to prevent that from happening because in principle, um, you, could, you could do that. And you also don't want to, um, you'll see in this model, you, you, you certainly don't want to have um, excess financial assets at the end of your, um, at, at, at very late points in your life. Okay, so here are the first order conditions. Here's the Hamiltonian. And here's the first order condition. So let me, let, me, let me take a long time to talk about this. To solve these kind of problems, remember it's a, it's a control problem, Pontryagin's maximum principle, we did it with Ramsey. Um, and, and I think, I think uh, you're gonna get a great opportunity to use this method to think about the environment. Has he already done that yet? So Leopold and I conceived of this problem set that has the environment. And you can use the same methods we've learned with Ramsey to attack the environment problem. So it's pretty, pretty nifty. Now you can use it to attack the money problem, Sadrowski. So the Hamiltonian is, it's, it's basically the, the periodic thing you're maximizing plus a Lagrange multiplier times the periodic budget constraint or resource constraint. And all that is discounted by, because we're in a, we're in a current valued Lagrange multiplier world, we're gonna have this, Euler's constant raised to the negative RT um, as a discount factor, okay? Think of lambda as, the, as before, as the current value Lagrange multiplier on real wealth. So it's hitting the real wealth constraint, right? So what, what, can, what can our friend Sudrowski do in this model? He can control his consumption, so he controls a path of consumption over time. He controls a path of assets over time, real assets and he also controls the fraction of those real assets that are held in the form of money, okay? Now, of those three, MT and CT are true control variables. He cannot increase arbitrarily the bond holdings. So that's, a, that's an important consideration. We, see that, we saw that from the differential equation. So you can control, you can get rid of your money very quickly. You can't get rid of your assets very quickly. Right, so that's the, your, 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 your real bonds quickly. That's an, that's an assumption in the model. And that's gonna lead to money having this, this uh, sort of a property that it determines the price level today, but also the future expected money supplies will also affect the current price level. So let's just finish this part describing the optimal behavior of our friend. Okay, so what, what is he doing? The first two first order conditions are the, involve the control variable. So the, for every period in T, the marginal utility of consumption is equal to the marginal utility of wealth, just like with Ramsey. Real wealth. Remember, the budget constraint is in real terms. So no messing around with, with, uh, with Sidrowski, he's doing it right, okay? The second one regards or concerns his 
cho choice of money in each period. So how much money does, does uh, Sadrowski want to hold? Well, he's going to equate the marginal utility of a bit more of that stuff with the opportunity cost. And what, are the what is the opportunity cost of holding more money? In the next instant, it's the interest rate times the value to him of getting something for that um, interest. So it's the, the product of the opportunity cost of holding money times the margin utility of wealth. So the lambda appears in two different places here. Why? Because if, if, if uh, Sidrowski holds more money, basically he's giving up on interest plus inflation, and that could have been real consumption for him. So that's the trade-off. Right? That's the key trade-off. He's going to be indifferent between moving uh, his current wealth between consumption today and holding money as a means of giving utility today. And that's the key insight of having money in the utility function as we've got it right now. OK, yeah. I skipped that. I skipped that for convenience. But here we only use lambda without the additional. Yeah. That's called making it simple for you because mm -hmm. that step is now that you understand it, you don't have to do it anymore. So it's also true in Campante. They do the same thing. They just, I notice a lot of textbooks say, well, now that you've seen it, we'll just go right to the end. So you could do it. The re another reason I don't do it, fun fact, is that mu has a special place already. It's the money growth rate. So I don't have too many crazy symbols going around. So we skipped, we skipped the present value Lagrange multiplier step because you know how to do it. And you know, I know I'm not assuming too much because you're following it. That's great. Um, thanks for asking. So I cut to the quick. I cut to the lambda. So lambda is the current value of the Lagrange multiplier. The last first order condition says that lambda has to have a, an equation of motion of its own, okay? That's gonna be very convenient for us to ignore. So we're gonna focus on money, so we're gonna make, we're gonna make this, th this last equation kind of shut up. It's just gonna, we're gonna shut it down. Okay, I'll show you how in a second. How would I shut it down? How would I shut down the last equation? When I say shut it down, I mean, Lambda dot equals zero. <laughs> exactly. So if people are exactly as impatient as the interest rate, then we can ignore that equation. And that's what Campanti does. A lot of people did. Ramsey uh, didn't do it, obviously, and then Sudrowski didn't do it. But he was focusing on some stuff that's more advanced. So just to focus on money, we're gonna, we're gonna assume that people have equal patience um, patients equal to the real interest rate. And I've already fixed it, right? So it's a, it's a real, it's a, it's a tapered down version of this. Okay, and I, so you anticipated my next line, right? Thank you very much. So we can ignore the last equation. And in, in, the, fa in the phase diagram, that makes a lot of, that makes it life so easy for us. We don't have to do a phase diagram like we did before with Ramsey. Okay. Again, it's just to focus on the, on the money, opportunity, cost, inflation nexus. So I take those first two, and I solve for the interest rate on the, the right-hand side to have a ratio of two margin utilities. This is saying that the interest rate in, in macro models around the world are basically the marginal rate of substitution of consumption for real balances. Right? How much am I willing to sacrifice in consumption for a little bit of extra real money? because there is a sacrifice, so it better be worth it. If the interest rate is really high, I'm gonna to try to scale down uh, my holding of, of, of real uh, money, so V prime will be higher relative to U prime. That, that left-hand side is the marginal rate of substitution. If you write it out, you can see it, right? It's uh, the ratio of two derivatives, and they're both in terms of utility, which are directly comparable. So it's like, it's like DC, DM. It's like a marginal rate of substitution. 
So holding consumption constant, interest rates have a negative effect on my desired holding of money. So this is what I want you to understand for your life. If we do face 20% inflation in Germany, you're going to want to economize on your bank balances. You, maybe you're getting BAföG or something, you know. BAföG doesn't react to inflation. It doesn't rise with inflation. Maybe the government will decide to give you a bit more later. My, my wages don't rise with inflation. That's illegal in Germany. We don't have indexed wages for, for government officials, professors, right? So I have to go on strike to get more money. That's America. That's Germany. <laughs> so think about it, right? So holding money in high inflation periods is costly. So keep, keep it down, try to spend the money, get, get into the real bond if I can. And I can in this model. Okay, so you can see that just by taking the derivative and solving for the, for the, the, uh, the implicit derivative dm di. So we have a micro foundation. Sudrowski gives us a micro foundation of the demand for money. Okay, I'm going to try to massage that a little bit more uh, in a second. But is, are there any questions right now? Now, I will show you pictures later of countries that have had burst of inflation. And you see that the real money demand goes down. You see that real balances go down. So a great example of that is Bulgaria. Bulgaria had a currency reform in the mid-90s. Inflation went way up. I actually was there. I saw it happen. And there were no goods on the shelves because people were holding back the goods. They were buying the goods, maybe to sell them later. You go to a store, you couldn't see any. There were no goods because people just cleaned up. They said, oh, inflation's coming. Get ready. Right? So that's anybody understands that. But understanding it in this model requires being an economist. Right? And it's not just about stores and, and goods on the shelf. It's about a lot of other things. Building a house real quick, because if you build a house, you got your money in real assets instead of having it in paper. That's kind of the, the, the notion that we're trying to push here. We're not done yet, because we haven't said what the government's up to. What is the government doing? The government might not give any, inject any money into the system at all. Or it might be really just pushing it in there. Um, it turns out that in the long run, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the real allocation. OK, but we need to show that. And we need to show that because um, the change of real balances that an agent faces um, depends on both the nominal rate, rate of money growth, which is the transfer, as well as the inflation rate. So to do this model properly, you have to get the inflation rate. You have to back it out of the, um, of the equilibrium. So we'll go back to this again. Right? We've already said this, um, just reminding you. So where does this transfer come from? Well, the transfer is coming from uh, um, the government is literally knocking on every door and giving people uh, new money in proportion to what they had before. Okay. Because everyone's the same, it's not a really outrageous statement. But in the real world, it's kind of difficult to do that. It's kind of difficult. The government could find everyone with a bank, with a bank account and try to zap them the money. But not everybody has a bank account. You could try to give everyone some, some credit on their electricity bill, or like the German government's trying to do with respect to gas. right? But you have to have a gas bill. So what, what about people who don't have those things? Pretty interesting, right? So if I started handing out 50 euro banknotes, you'd, you'd probably be interested. Um, but if I do that all around Germany, um, you get suspicious. Maybe, maybe something um, is going to happen as a result. So the transfers take this form, right? If the government's going to transfer something, it, the money growth rate has to at least compensate people for the inflation loss they have. Now, if you do this and you assume that y is constant, in income is constant, then it's really easy to show that consumption will be constant. There's no reason for you to change consumption over time. Rho is equal to R, so there's no Keynes-Ramsey rule. So basically, we just have that. That's the relevant condition for us today. And you see that the money demand is an inverse 
has an inverse because, because the second derivative of V is negative, interest rates have a negative effect on our desired holdings of money because interest rate reflects the opportunity cost of holding money as the sum of a real interest rate, which could be negative. Inflation could be very high and not, and not even cover the um, um, Nominal interest rates money and not even cover the, uh, the real rate of interest rate, so it could be negative. But at any rate, that's your opportunity cost. And if we substitute, we end up getting this equation. Okay, so if you think of uh, what this means, this means that in, a, in the Sadrowski model, where people's impatience is the same as the, the real interest rate, then impatience plus inflation cover, the, cover the, uh, the waterfront, that's it. That's the entire story. And this is what they do in the, in the book, okay? So you can actually substitute it um, into this equation of motion for real money and eliminate uh, the inflation rate completely. Okay, so what does that mean? There are two equilibrium in this model. If you look at that carefully, to find an equilibrium as, as, a, as a steady state of, of little m, where little m doesn't change anymore, because nothing else is changing except for the money supply, um, y is constant. So there are two equilibrium. One is that people don't believe the money has any value. The price of goods in terms of money is infinite from the very beginning. Nobody touches this stuff, right? So we don't have a, we don't have an inada condition on real balances, so you do, you're not going to be totally miserable if you have no money at all. You'll have a barter economy. You will be kind of miserable because we have to, you know, you want to come to my lecture, you're going to have to pay me in terms of a haircut or something, right? <laughs> but you could imagine a world like that. It would be kind of an unhappy world. That's why money is probably a good thing. But the first equilibrium is, is the bad equilibrium. That's a hyperinflation equilibrium. Maybe people are using uh, South African rands or maybe they're using American dollars in Zimbabwe, right? But they're not using the local currency. And the other one, people do believe that money will have value in the future, Prices, the price level will be finite, um, and they think they can, they'll have real value. Okay, so you can, you can draw this. This is where I part ways with Campanti et al. There are two equilibria in this model. One is the left-hand dot, and the other is the right-hand dot. And M star is the real balances that you hold in the good equilibrium where money has value, okay? Now, in that, in that equilibrium, the nominal supply of money is growing at rate rho. So the price level is growing at rate rho. So we have monetary neutrality. We also have monetary super neutrality. It doesn't affect anything except the utility of the agents. Right? The agents, the agents uh, are not necessarily happy holding less money because holding more real balances makes them happier. So if you have high inflation, they're going to hold less balances. They're going to be running around a lot more with, the, with real cash uh, to conduct their purchases. Okay, so even in that particular example, you might be losing utility because you could have more real money. So this is a, a really deep point. How do we get to this equilibrium? Suppose we change something. Suppose we change the rate of growth of money. I'll show you this um, next week. The price level does all the lifting in this model. The price level jumps to make everything um, consistent, to make um, real holdings equal to demand, to the demand for real money equal to, equal to supply. So money is neutral, and because money, because, you know, this is a case of where the, the, the academics dispute, have a dispute with each other, basically. They're, they're fighting about what super neutrality really is. So when I was in grad school, super neutrality was, it has no effect on your consumption. So I put this in here as it was originally designed. But people are less happy because they're, they have less real money to, to use. You don't get any direct utility from, from money, you get this indirect utility. So if, if the inflation rate is higher, 
Consumption is the same, but you're holding less real money, and therefore you're, you could be happier, right? You could have, we could have lower inflation, people have more real balances. They'd still be consuming the same, but they'd have less disutility of having to run around um, like if you're in a country with high inflation. This is not a general result. Okay, so I, I said this already, if the cross derivative in a more general utility function is, is non-zero, then it could affect my consumption utility as well, right? And I can tell stories where that makes sense. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of the super neutrality proposition. I'm a fan of the neutrality proposition. And, and why? Because if you talk to people in high inflation countries, they're not happy. And they also say, I can't consume as much because I'm spending all my time you know, I can't work, I have to read the newspapers and get, or the, go online and find out what the exchange rate is every five minutes because the exchange rate is devaluing and I have to get, I have to hold my wealth in dollars or some other form. Okay, so now I'm about to launch into the, the extension of this. And this is where it gets really exciting because we had some real life examples of what happens in Germany, for example, in 1921, 22, 23. I'll probably spill into the next lecture talking about it. A little bit of economic history, a few pictures. Um, Kagan um, was a kind of a, interested in monetary, student of Milton Friedman, uh, looking at, the, at Hungary and Italy and Argentina, countries that had had high inflation. I think he didn't really look at Argentina, but his students did look at Argentina. He looked at Germany. His big point of interest was Germany because Germany had a really high inflation. The only inflation we've seen that comes close to that in the recent, uh, in the recent decades has been Zimbabwe, 2007, eight, okay? Uh, but it keeps coming back. So this is not a, we haven't conquered inflation. And we, we haven't conquered the causes of inflation, which is when the government creates too much, too much money. But the Kagan model teaches us that in expectations of the future just like with Sadrowski, are the key thing. People want to know what's going to happen to their purchasing power of the stuff that they're holding. Otherwise, they're going to put it in something that is immune or inoculated to that inflation. So why would the central bank do that? So we always have to ask this question, why um, does the government do this to the people? And it's usually very easy to understand. The government has a deficit Government deficit means the, the expenditures exceed revenues. What are the revenues? Taxes. What other revenues does the government have? They, maybe they have import duties. Maybe they sell some of the family silver. Maybe they own, maybe you're Nor you live in Norway and they own half the world and they get interest income, on, investment income on that. Um, well, in fact, the government um, often creates money because the government knows it can get away with it. It's kind of a, it's kind of a deal. The government guarantees the, the legal tender aspect and then as a result it gets to create a little bit. The government is, has a monopoly on money creation today, either directly or through its central bank, usually in modern economies through its central bank. A little bit of money creation is probably not a bad thing, right? because we get utility from having money, so the government should at least put some out there. Uh, if, if it puts it out at a higher and higher growth rate, it makes people happier and happier in the short run, but in the long run, uh, prices catch up. And the whole point of prices catching up is what it's all about. If people understand all the time, then nothing will happen. So Kagan used a discrete model version of this to understand that. This is, I think this is quite elegant. We'll write, we'll show this, we we'll use it to show that the price level today in the Kagan model depends on expected future monetary policy. So to, to, to battle inflation, you have to convince people that future monetary policy is going to be under control. It's a very powerful message. Expectations are everything. Not just expectations of today. Today we know what's going on, but tomorrow and the next day, five years from now. Okay, so how do, I do, how do I get to the Kagan model from Sadrowski? I'm going to take this V function and I'm going to assume a particular form for it. I'm going to use a particular form. So this is something we can, we can play with. This is called the Hara utility function or the Hara uh, function. Isoelastic, the elasticity 
of utility with respect to the argument is constant. Okay? So look at that, look at that real carefully. That's a very general class of functions we use for, we can, you can put C in there and you have a utility for, of consumption. I think maybe you might have seen that in, in the Ramsey model. Maybe, maybe Leopold showed that to you. If you haven't, don't worry. But look at that thing, look at it carefully. It's, it's the, the argument raised to a power, minus one, and that, there's a good reason for that. It's a technical reason. And then you're dividing by one minus gamma. Gamma is, the, is, the control, is con, gonna control a very important per, uh, concept, which is the elasticity, okay? Now, why did I put the minus one? Well, if you let gamma go to one, what happens? If gamma gets close to one, yeah? You're dividing by something that's getting close to zero. It gets really big. That's okay, but if it's, equal to z if it's equal to one, you're in trouble. It's not defined, okay? So it's, 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 a, it's a pretty cool function, but when gamma equals one, it's not defined. You cannot divide by zero. So how do you get around that? You use L'Hopital's rule, which says, in calculus, what happens if you let gamma get real close in the limit, it turns into the logarithmic function. Fun fact, <laughs> right? So it's a log function. So if at gamma equals one, we say it's the log function. So this is a trick that economists have, have had to struggle with, but it's, it's fine. Cool, right? And it gives us a, an elasticity that is not equal to one. The log function has an elasticity of one. You increase the argument by 1%, you increase the outcome by 1%. Or if you multiply it by something, something times that. So that's, a, that's, a, um, that's the isoelastic function. Now, those of you who've taken finance know that this has something to do with risk aversion. Forget it, but it's, it's interesting. In this particular setup, those two are, are kind of related to each other, the curvature. Um, of the function is kind of parameterized by gamma, and one minus gamma is the um, is the inverse. So it's going to be the elasticity of intertemporal substitution in this problem. But gamma also par parameterizes the aversion to risk that you might have. But forget that. There's no risk in this model. Okay. So I talk about L'Hopital's rule just to, in case you've seen it before, and. In the cases of gamma going to zero, it's going to imply um, a very high elasticity of substitution, and um, and one is this case where of the logarithmic form. And then if if uh, gamma goes to infinity, we have something like like a like a very very low elasticity of substitution. So let's let's look what happens. Take the derivative. Take the first derivative of that with respect to to m. What do you get? You get a beautiful function. It's just, it's just m raised to a power, right? That's the whole point. The constants evaporate because you differentiate a constant with respect to anything, it goes away. So we differentiate that, that function with respect to m. We get m to the minus gamma power. Now you see why economists love this isoelastic function, okay? Now if I put that in the first order condition, look what I get. I'm gonna get that. So I can solve for m as a function of the, the nominal interest rate, which is rho plus the inflation rate. OK, so now I've got a closed form money demand function. If I take logarithms of both sides, I get the log of m is, the, is minus 1 divided by gamma times the sum of, in, of the discount rate and the inflation rate. So I have something like an elasticity of demand of the money, demand for money function. Right? So this is, this is why I'm torturing you with Sudrowski, because we get to this equation. Look how beautiful it is. Take logs of that. You've got a, you've got a, a, a constant semi-elasticity of demand for money, and it's equal to 1 divided by gamma. OK, so there must be some reason for me to torture you with this derivation because that's going to help us understand the Kagan model. Kagan, 
uh, took that and ran with it. Because look, MT, MT is the real demand for money. Okay, if I take logs of that, it's gonna be the log of M, capital M, minus the log of capital P. And I've got inflation on the right-hand side, so I've got P on both sides. That, Im that implies a value of PT, given PT plus one. So this, this is the secret to understanding where prices are going in this model. But just right now, understand, we've already done a lot. We've derived the money demand function. You may never see it again. I think you will see it again, because people will talk about it if we get 20% inflation. We won't in the next year, but we're gonna, we've got 10% inflation. It's already pretty costly to hold money in a bank account that doesn't bear interest. So if you take both logs of both sides, you get the log of the real money um, demand on the left-hand side, and you get this semi-elastic semi -elastic, um, form on the right-hand side. So we call this the, the semi-elasticity. Now, let's, let's, write, let's make the Kagan jump. Kagan jumps to discrete time. So we were in continuous time. So now let's think of t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 3. Instead of t continuous, it's t discrete. This is to make life easy for all of us. If I do that, then the in inflation rate is pt plus 1 in logarithms. So it's the, the logarithm of pt plus 1 minus the log of pt. Now see where I'm, go I'm going now. I'm gonna, that, that must be holding in every period. Mt is always a function of the next period's price level. OK? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some pictures now. We're going to take it, take it down a notch, and then we're going to finish that next time. But in a world with flexible prices, which we have here, the, the real money demand today depends on the expected rate of inflation, either in continuous time or in discrete time. Okay. So people are always looking forward. They're always looking to the next period. And that's why when you have high inflation, people are really looking forward. They're kind of scared that the price level is going to jump by another 70% next year. You better make sure that you get a pay increase. Otherwise, you're working for peanuts. It depends negatively on the current price level because given the expectation of the future price, if the current price is lower, the inflation rate is higher. Conversely, the higher the price level today, given your expectation of the future price, the lower the expected rate of inflation is. And we also saw already that money demand depends on real economic activity. So in countries that are more prosperous, have more real economic activity per capita, they'll have more uh, demand for money for transactions purposes. OK, so this is what Kagan, Kagan was, was talking about. Kagan was talking about how this happens. And what I'd like to, what I'd like to do is maybe think about how inflation um, gets started before I start talking about Zimbabwe. Next time we'll talk about Zimbabwe and I'll write down the, the Kagan model in detail. So the questions we're gonna be asking right now are what determines monetary growth? What determines um, people's expectations of future uh, monetary growth? Therefore, what ex determines people's expectations of inflation? What sets inflation into motion? The model I'm talking about here, and the one we talked about last week, anytime you have flexible prices, it's a model without frictions. There's nothing holding people back from doing um, what they do. So if prices were being set by firms, they would have no restriction from setting prices. We have no firms in this model. The price level just evolves as a function of people's behavior. And then how do you stop it? What is the ultimate way of putting a break on inflation? and the expectations as well. OK, so just to, in, your, in the next course you may be taking, in fact, in the second half of my course, we will stop talking about money completely. We'll start talking about the interest rate, monetary policy. Um, this is kind of a, a, it's a good development because at the time it made a lot of sense. We kind of took the ball off uh, the long, long run determinants of inflation and we had these financial crises. So in some sense, this is in apposition to what we'll do um, in the second half of the course. What I'm about to do 
um, next week and show you the, the taking the Kagan model to the limit um, means that we have to think about the money supply. But right now, and maybe in your other courses you've taken at this university or other places, you haven't spent much time thinking about it. And the reason why is because some very, very smart people have shown us that in some sense, understanding economies in low inflation situations, you don't have to track the money supply. It's sufficient for the central bank to declare a target of inflation. And declaring a target is like declaring a rate of money growth because we know monetary neutrality will hold. And since we don't care about money that much, declaring a, a target rate of inflation is sufficient. And that's why Michael Woodford and John Taylor basically have thought about macroeconomics without recourse, without, without reference to the money supply. So again, the tension I was talking about that, we, that, that I'm trying to get into your head um, involves thinking about the role of money in an economy and thinking about a role of interest rates in the economy. The Fed, the Central Bank of, of, of the European Monetary Union or J the Bank of Japan um, set an interest rate. But the demand for money is always there. It's always in the background, okay? So understanding how a situation like we had in the 1990s could, could change turn into a situation like we have possibly in the 2020s uh, is part of monetary economics. So don't forget that. And the, um, we had a great moderation. We had very low inflation. But now we have a inflation coming back. It may make sense to think about um, this Kagan model. And the reason why is we have these extreme cases. OK, we've had Zimbabwe. I talked about uh, Serbia. Uh, the Ukraine, Ukraine in the 1990s, um, I can name a bunch, right? Um, Germany. I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call Turkey a hyperinflation. Turkey is by no means a hyperinflation. The, de the standard definition is 50% per month. We are far from there. But the point is we have it in some countries more than in others. It's mostly a problem of developing countries. And it can happen very quickly, OK? And that's, in my view, why you cannot ignore the money supply completely. Any good course in macro has to have some mention of it. So I'm mentioning it right now as much as I can. And then we're going to drop it. But it's worth spending a few, a few minutes talking about. Most importantly, once you get high inflation, it's very hard to get it down. You end up having to put the economy into a very, very bad situation because prices are freely set by agents all over the place. How do you change that? If you have a, a liberal market economy where the, the, price, the control over prices is not part of the government's toolkit, there's no way. You can decree all you want. It's not going to change things. And ultimately, the way we def defeat inflation is you have to cause a recession. You have to cause negative pressure on prices. You have to create misery in the economy. And that's the way the United States did it in the 19, late 1970s. It's the way Germany did it in the 19, uh, 19, early 1920s. Okay, You have to do some other things to make people convinced that inflation is not going to rear its head again. So you may have to reform the system of money creation, the central bank's dependency on the government. But ultimately, all these things have to come together. But the short-run conquest of inflation involves bad times. And that's why people are talking about it right now, even at this moderate rate of inflation. If we want to get back to the good old days, we're probably going to have to see a recession. To understand why that's the case, it's expectations, but also the labor market and unemployment and economic activity in general. OK. so. When I come back, we'll talk, next week we'll talk about this. So this is just to give you an example of how bad it can get. And this is not a ter terribly stable situation. These are, these are the, this is M, big M, big P, and pi. Okay, so let January 1922 be one. <laughs> so already in one year, 
the amount of currency that Germany created in the year 1922 was 16 times larger. That's a big increase in M. Okay? Prices, however, increased by 75-fold. So what happened to the real balances in that period? Remember our formula? M, little m dot is equal to mu minus pi times little m. So which one is higher? I think m had to go down, right? People were trying to get rid of that money in 1922 already. Of course, it didn't stop. Look at prices outstripping the supply. So Germany was creating money, but it wasn't, it was clearly, people were trying to get rid of it as fast as they were creating it. And look at the last, the last period, 1923, um, October. These are very large numbers, okay? This is what Turkey did in 60 years. Germany was able to do in less than two years. That's a hyperinflation. Inflation um, on a compound basis, so high that you have to really measure it in, in rates of change per month. Sometimes you don't even collect the statistics fast enough. Sometimes it's impossible to collect the statistics. You know, you go in there and say, well, how much does this, this, this box of uh, oatmeal cost? And I say, what oatmeal? We don't have any. <laughs> if we had some, we'd sell it for this much. Right? So it's, it's a real measurement problem. This is what it looked like. These are pictures from the time. Um, I used to collect stamps when I was a kid, and I loved the German hyperinflation series because they were blank, and they would stamp them. You go to the post office, and they would stamp. Every day, they would put a different denomination on there, you know, depending on uh, what the price of a, of a, a briefmark was. So that's, a, in German, eine Billion is, is an English trillion or a, a British billion, but an American trillion, 10 to the 12th power. So depending on what time of the day or year that was, that was a lot of money or not much at all. So look at those. Look at look what they're doing with the, with this stuff. <laughs> this is not a joke, you know. I mean, these are these are kids making kites with the money. People using it to to keep their their apartments warm, which is kind of chilling thought. And then some kids playing with it, and um, maybe collecting it, making a dress out of it. It's Berlin. That's a picture from Berlin. And people taking, the central bankers taking the cash to the, to the banks and wheelbarrows. And the, the last one is awesome. The lower left is just amazing. People picking up their paychecks and, and getting ready to pay. So this is the end, this is what Zimbabwe dealt with in, in 2008 in the fall. Okay, so how do we get there? Expectations, but expectations confirmed by action. That's gonna be the, the subject of, of the next uh, lecture and then we'll move to sort of modern macroeconomics afterwards. Okay, thanks for coming, thanks for dealing with this.